In his early 20s, in his home state of Illinois, he was elected to the state legislature serving in both the State House of Representatives and the State Senate. In 1958, in one of those landmark changes in political uh, history that I think Kevin Phillips talked about yesterday, he was elected to the United States Congress as the youngest member of Congress elected that year. I think he was something like 28 years of age. He came out of a more machine-type politics of Chicago. Those of you who remember Mayor Richard Daley, uh, Mayor Daley relied on Dan Rostenkowski as his uh, spokesman, as his eyes and ears in the federal government for the city of Chicago and that was when he was in his early 20s. Uh, some of you have asked the question about the impasse that now occurs in Washington, the sort of gridlock in political processing. In the 1960s, when I was at the White House on President Johnson's staff, things were different then. Dan Rostenkowski basically spoke for the entire Illinois delegation, and when President Johnson had a program that he wanted to pursue. He would bring leaders such as uh, Senator Ev Dirksen, Senator Mike Mansfield, House leaders, and people like Dan Rostenkowski. They would have a give and take, and when a deal was done, when an agreement was made, uh, those leaders delivered their troops. And it's a lot different today, but maybe Chairman Rostenkowski will take a question as to his observations of how this gridlock can be changed. In the 1970s, Dan Rostenkowski was the number three leader in the House of Representatives, the Democratic Whip, which is the position that Bill Gray occupies today, and you heard from here, him earlier. And then in 1980, uh, he was elected chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. In our country, probably the four or five most important or most influential and most powerful positions in government, of those, one would be the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee because he has jurisdiction to initiate all tax policy and trade policy, international trade policy, retirement income security policy, and certain welfare policy, a very powerful position. And he's held that job with great distinction. But for those of you who are concerned about the budget gridlock, I want to bring you up to date that that gridlock would have been much worse this year and perhaps not even be addressed had it not been for Dan Rostenkowski. Because in the spring of this year, when the president's budget was basically dead on arrival on Capitol Hill and everybody was wringing hands and not taking any kind of action, Dan Rostenkowski basically blew up and said, let's talk frankly. And he put forth a very courageous budget package that contained significant spending cuts and tax increases, which was not a popular thing to do. But he got the dialogue moving, both on Capitol Hill and in private conversations with his friend, even though of the other party, and former colleague on the Ways and Means Committee, George Bush. And ultimately, that developed the budget process. So if anybody in Washington can be uh, thanked for getting the debate off an unreal course into a real and substantive dialogue, it's Dan Rostenkowski. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce him to you as our luncheon speaker. Chairman Dan Rostenkowski. I'm in high cotton here, I'll tell you that much. I look, I look at some of the people you've heard from, they must have said it all. You know, you talk about, uh, you talk about uh, Jim Jones and my friendship with George Bush, uh, and you talk about uh, when Jim Jones was uh, on the Committee on Ways and Means and how we tried to, to work together uh, you could uh, understand that uh, then 
we didn't have as many ind independent contractors in the Congress of the United States. We, we tried to, to work things out uh, so that uh, the party was represented. But you know, uh, when you've been in politics as long as I have, you have a tendency to get sentimental. Um, the good old days. And when you consider the pickle that we find ourselves in now, the past looks really even more appealing. <laughs> There's more junk up here. <laughs> you know, there was a time early in my career as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee when I spent more than a little time worrying about what Jim Jones was up to. I heard rumors that he was scurrying around to liberalize depreciation allowances or cut capital gains rates. It's probably accurate to say that I didn't share Jim's uh, enthusiasm for these breaks or his ideas about how to help the oil industry. But I admired his enthusiasm nonetheless. Things got a little better when Jim became the chairman of the Budget Committee, partly because he had so many new chores that he couldn't focus as much on tax issues. And I like to think that he gained a new appreciation of what it means to be a chairman. In short, he learned that it isn't all bad, uh, it isn't really all a bed of roses. There are thorns too. So it's remarkable how our perceptions change over time. Back when Jim chaired the Budget Committee, we thought we had a deficit problem. But when you compare that situation to today's, you can quickly conclude that those were the good old days. <laughs> I watched recent budgets debate, budget debates here at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue with somewhat uh, disappointing uh, attitudes. After that, I can only say that the world would be a better place if we had Jim Jones back in Congress. He was frustrated with the process when he left. Boy, I'd settle for that level of frustration right now in a minute. The bottom line is, who's sorry now? My pal Jim Jones has a good job and is probably at least as provocative as he was when he served in the Congress. For all I know, maybe even so successful that he has reason to worry about the surtax contained in the Democratic budget plan. <laughs> <clears throat> but then again, our loss is your gain. I'd like uh, today to talk a bit about what I think has gone wrong with the budget process, about why I yearn for the good old days which weren't really all that long ago. Something is seriously wrong here. For years, the Republicans said that government wasn't the solution. It was the problem. Now they've almost made their dream come true. What a sad day for America. It has become a cliche to say that Amer the American economy has become a casino society during the 1980s, where clever bets were valued more than smart investments. Take the money and run seemed to be the operating principle. Government has become a game, a sitcom, where some participants seem to be more interested in entertaining than in enlightening, where the glitter of politics often overwhelms the daily grit of governing. In Washington, we have an annual budget negotiations that some think have come to resemble an extended game of very high-stakes poker with an element of Russian roulette just to make things a bit more interesting. In fact, that characterization is a bit misleading. Our game is really closer 
to economic chicken if both sides stick to their guns and refu refuse to move, we'll have a crash that injures everyone. Such a collision would involve massive cuts in nearly all government programs. It would inflict inconvenience on all of our citizens and pain on many of them. It would be a major embarrassment to all politicians involved Blaming the other side isn't an adequate answer. The American people blame us all, and they're right. I think that part of our difficulty in the budget negotiations involves our reliance on such misleading gambling analogies. In that business, when all the customers lose, the house wins. But in our business, there is a real possibility that everyone will lose. It may be more helpful to use marriage as an analogy. The partners have different interests, but a shared investment in their partnership. They seek solutions that are both positive and mutually satisfactory. No one can win in on everything. There is nothing dishonorable about compromising. Those are lessons we seem to forget and have to be painfully retaught time and after time. I supported the bipartisan budget summit deal that was rejected earlier this month. It wasn't perfect. Nothing political ever is. There's an ample supply of short-term pain and that sacrifice is much more obvious than long-term gain. The package created by the President and the bipartisan congressional leadership was hard for anyone to love. That is why we Democrats also wrote an alternative in an attempt to take off some of the rough edges. But even the Democratic alternative isn't something to cheer about. There's still plenty of discomfort involved. We just tried to distribute it in a fairer manner. These plans become worthwhile only when you seriously consider the alternative. On the one hand, we could have just thrown up our hands and allowed sequestration to do the job for us. That would have been a sad defeat for the political process. It would have created major problems for many people while leaving virtually others untouched. It would have raised a lot of questions about fairness. So a summit compromise is clearly better than sequestration. Of course, we could have made a different deal. There was nothing inevitable or particularly compelling about the package that emerged. We could, of course, have tried to protect individual voters and taxpayers by drastically increasing the corporate income tax rate. But I strongly oppose that because it would have done violence to the basis of the 1986 Tax Reform Act. The summit rejected those options and tried instead to come up with a deficit reduction package that spread the burden evenly and wouldn't sabotage an already fragile economy. Only time will tell how successful the summit was. This massive deficit reduction effort is only the beginning of a long process of recovery. There are a lot of problems we face that cannot be resolved without spending money. The goals have been embraced by President Bush, who says that we have more will than wallet. <clears throat> the sad fact is that will without wallet won't be adequate to get the job done. Getting the deficit down would make it possible to confront some critical problems we've been ducking for too long a period of time. Problems of homelessness, drug addiction, roads and bridges that are falling down, an environment that is hazardous to our health, 
and crime that threatens all of our neighborhoods. Then there are the drugs that are distracting our youth and the education system that is failing them. None of these problems can be solved on the cheap, my friends. Under the new budget rules, we've adopted a new, initi a new initiatives and must be financed under these initiatives on a pay-as-you-go basis. That means anyone who has the bright idea about new ways to spend federal funds must either come up with a comparable cut in existing programs or are willing to raise new revenues. This will be a new but appropriate discipline for many of my colleagues, but not only for Congress, but for the President as well and his successors. I believe it is a tremendously important step forward. It requires us to be honest with our constituents and tell them you only get what you pay for and you have to pay for everything you get. There is no revenue ferry who doles out generous peace dividend to those in need. Nor is there a willingness to accept fancy rhetoric that argues for spending big money now in the hope of saving more money later. It would be better and probably cheaper if our government responded to problems earlier. But that's just crying over spilt milk. Today's question is whether we have the stomach to stop trying to assign the blame for the mess and work together to clean up the mess. I don't often agree with Senator Phil Graham, the father of the Graham-Rudman rules, but he had it exactly right the other day when he said people have to decide if they want to govern or they want to protest. And I also concur with my old friend Bob Dole, who sent this warning to his colleagues. If you don't want to lead and make the tough choices, you should look for another line of work. I suspect the voters are thinking that as well. Too many have decided that protesting is a lot more fun. That's partly because the growing schism between governing and politics. Governing requires tough choices. Politics seems to demand slick slogans that obscure and distort the real issues. Consider this warning from a political pollster who said, the dominant feeling voters appear to have on this issue is, we didn't create the, the deficit, we did not benefit from it, and it is not fair to put the burden of solving the deficit on our backs. I have no doubt that this accurately reflects some public opinion, but I am equally certain that the people who reflect this view are just plain wrong. And I think many of our constituents know that. My friends, voters did create the deficit. They demanded more public spending than they were willing to pay for. They resisted democratic efforts to cut defense spending. They rejected Republican efforts to cut existing domestic programs. And they embraced and crusade to hold the line against tax increases, irrespective of the impact on the budget. For the last decade, they've been all too ready to believe the economic fairy tale that claimed they could have all they wanted from the government without paying for it. For years, they've gotten more than they paid for. Now, the bills are coming due, and some voters don't like it. So they blame the savings and loan bandits, even though the public enjoyed the abnormally high interest rates that were offered on their savings account. 
and the elected officials are blamed, despite the fact <coughs> that the voters enthusiastically embraced all the component budget decisions that led to our current problems. There was no stealth budget policy during the 80s. The press reported on the annual debate. There were a lot of confusing numbers, but the bottom line was always obvious. We were spending billions of dollars we simply didn't have. The basic question behind the current budget debate is whether, whether we're going to confront reality to continue or to hide. For years, we've been economic ostriches. Some politicians apparently find having their head buried in the sand a comfortable posture. I don't. I think we underestimate the American people. I believe they are ready to face the music. I suspect that they are hungry for courageous leadership and honest answers. Ultimately, they enjoyed the party. Now it's time to pay the bill. My friends, we could dodge the issue yet again and simply slip the Graham Rudman targets, or we could come up with another cosmetic plan like we did last year that would hide the economic rot for another year. But the deeper problem would remain. I remain convinced that deficits exceeding $200 billion a year do matter. They weaken our competitive status in the international trade. They may threaten our standard of living. They definitely are mortgages for our children's future. I think it is unconscionable that we are borrowing money to live a good life today and that our kids will be asked to pay for the bills tomorrow. We're the richest country in the world and we can't afford to solve our problems. We may be the only remaining superpower in the world, but paralyzed by domestic economic problems. I hope that our international indifference is finally coming to an end, that people will be induced to face reality. If we face the facts now, we can work together to create a brighter future. If we don't, my greatest fear is that we'll be the victims rather than the beneficiaries of events to come. I came to Washington more than 30 years ago to serve the people of Chicago. I am identified with big issues like the Tax Reform Act of 1986. But I have also fought to protect my constituents. I'm proud to be an architect of federal subsidies for mass transit programs. I make no apology for my efforts to build a stronger city of Chicago. I wish I had been more successful. But I also like to think that I have made these efforts honestly and have been careful not to promise more than I can ultimately deliver. The most important thing that a politician has is his or her credibility. The issue in this current budget debate is whether that credibility, which has declined to a really shameful level in the past dozen years can be restored. We will, in the next several days, make some tough decisions. There's a Democratic proposition. There's a Republican proposition or a bipartisan proposition. But we have to come to grips with compromising so that a president can sign legislation that will keep the doors of government open. I'm willing to stay here and work 
But I also want a president in the White House that won't suggest in the process he'll veto something. Give us a chance to work things out. And don't be afraid to compromise. We compromise. That's what my job has been. Certainly I have principles and I've come up with a democratic alternative. I have given my colleagues in the House of Representatives an opportunity to vote for what they think are the principles they stand for. If I lose, I'll be in conference working on the bill that we'll pass. But the most important thing is to get level-headed people together, not in cement, but fluid enough to come up with answers for the American people. I think they want us to leave. I've just noted in the last 62 hours that as soon as we came up with a program, people took sides. And that's what they want to do. They want to be able to choose. We've been floundering around. And I'll tell you, as I conclude, I'm a legislator, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of the fact that legislators are now doing their job so that we can present to the executive in the very short time what the legislative branch of government is concerned with and what we think ought to be done. And at that point in time, the president can make his decision. <coughs> Thank you very much. Your questions? I'll be glad to uh, avoid answering any questions that you ask. <laughs> Yes, sir. Your country has. You did a good job, I think, initiating a worldwide competitive uh, bringing down of the tax rates, especially of the corporate and income taxes. And the other question is uh, from a structural point of view, as far as I know, the consumer in your country is about uh, two thirds of the uh, GMP. Uh, you are missing some productivity problems, I think, and uh, it's a related capital industry, a good industry. In my feeling, it's a little bit underdeveloped, only in proportion to this other point. Well, to answer your first question, uh, I, I, I've forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> to answer your first question, uh, do, I, do I have a balance in the package? Every package, with the exception of one that has been presented, had met all the guidelines, first of what the summit wanted to do, what the, uh, what the budget committee required us to do, and I, I believe what the president has suggested that we do, except one, and that's uh, the Republicans in the House of Representatives. They did not meet their obligation with respect to balancing revenues and, and entitlement cuts. Uh, the other part of your question, uh, in my opinion, uh, we're criticized somewhat because of the growth ingredient in the package and that we haven't addressed that. Well, we have, we have in the Democratic alternative come up with a capital gains product that I think is f fair for the distribution of investment for middle America. That's what my obligation was when I put together a Democratic alternative. As far as growth is concerned, I think if we get our deficit down and we prove to many of you people that we're serious, that's a giant step forward in lowering the interest rates that we're paying and starting productivity. No, I didn't answer that question. Where's another one there? <laughs> we heard uh, lots of comments uh, yesterday and today. And today we heard the comments about the fact that communism is bankrupt. They have absolutely failed. Socialism in France failed. Socialism in Britain failed. What are we going to do to maintain our free enterprise system here without killing it? The question is what can we do uh, in the free enterprise system uh, to, to help bankrupt countries? No, no, no. <laughs> to help us. Okay. 
See, the nice thing about answering your question is I'll give him the answer that I thought he asked. <laughs> I've been in Russia and I've been behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, every place that I've gone in the last 15 years, our trading partners have consistently pointed their index finger at us and said, do something about your deficit. I think that's the cancer that's spread all over everything that we're doing in this country. We're losing our grips on education, uh, we're allowing crime to run rampant, and all we're doing is paying the third largest ingredient in our budget, the interest on the debt. We've got to address that. And I'll, I, I would like to marry your question with an observation. I've been in foreign lands where they are standing waiting for us to come and help them. They don't want investment from the neighbor because they want to be free and independent and make judgments about their own existence as opposed to being dependent on a neighbor. They want Americans to come to their, to, to their countries. They tell us, they tell us, Mr. Rustin Kuski, you geniuses in America, the ingenuity that you represent, where are you? You talk about a level playing field. Come here and build the ball field and we'll play on it. We want you here. And yet, because of our deficit, because we're sitting here arguing about whether or not we're going to become responsible and disciplined in our government, we can't do that. That's a shame. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> uh, sometimes I think our image is overblown by our, by our new trading partners. But unless we do something about ourselves, we're not going to be a first-rate power. They'll get used to trading with someone else. And they'll find it more convenient to trade with someone else. And so I think that we have for a long period of time hidden behind the blue smoke about what we're going to do with respect to reducing our obligations. Carrying the flag of a party, that has diminished. And there's no question about it. Everybody is, as, a, as I suggested earlier, an independent contractor. Uh, we're all individually raising money, and that's as obnoxious to me as it is to anybody else, because you get elected one day and you're raising money the next. I honestly, I honestly believe that uh, members of Congress, because they were out of the loop for as long as they were, became very bitter about being told these are the marks that we want you to approve. To accept, President, the the, uh, the the three members of the executive in the Senate, in the summit, the leadership of the Senate, of the Senate, the leadership of the House, did not ask for participation from our membership. Contrast that with the fact that we got together as Democrats, put together a bill, went to my caucus, and asked them what do they want in the bill. What now? It doesn't mean. That as long as I put together a program that I think is, is very attractive, and I'm looking for 219 votes, that they will have the courage to continue to support that. I don't know that. But we have also the benefit of total failure. And we don't like, in my opinion, looking like failures as, as elected representatives. That encourages me to believe that we're going to get together this time and we're going to pass something. Now, let me give you somewhat of a scenario. If I pass my bill, which is a democratic alternative and, and very attractive, and Benson passes his bill, and Benson passes his bill, and I'm sure that the president and the leadership of the Senate like that bill because they think they can pass that bill in the Senate side. Well, I can't pass their bill on the House side, and they can't pass my bill on the Senate side. But let's just suppose that we go to conference now I'm, now I'm stuck with, what does my Democratic leadership want to do? Does my, do? does my caucus want me to stand fast and firm on my bill? Because if I bring back Benson's bill to the House, that may not be acceptable. I think it'll be very important what the President does in all this. Now, if I could, if I could orchestrate the scenario, I'd love to pass my bill in both the House and the Senate, and send it to the president because it has his capital gains in it and he's been demanding that we do this for over two years. 
but we raise the rates. And of course, he'll raise the rates to 31%. That two percentage points is so terrible. But he won't, he won't sign the bill. I'd like for that to lie on the president's desk and have him make a judgment as to whether he wants to sign a bill that helps middle America, the lower income groups, that gives them a capital gain uh, opportunity, but, does, but cuts it across the middle income group, and that middle income group is below $125,000. They get an exclusion of $1,000 on a business or, or on anything that they're going to do with respect to, uh, to their second home. We also give the school teacher an opportunity, a, a one-year annual guarantee that she can save $1,000 if she's playing in the stock market a little bit. I mean, see, we do this for middle America. Now that, in my opinion, is what growth is. But I'd like for him to make a decision as to whether he wants to do that and sign the bill or veto the bill and say, the heck, I'm, I'm going to stop this because I don't want the 28 percenters to go up to 33 percenters. Boy, I'd like to take him to the polls on something like that. Now that's political. But I think that you're going to see members, because, because we are narrowing this down uh, to whether the government can function, I think you'll see some statesmanship. Yes, sir. Um, it appears that any type of securities transaction tax won't be in the final budget package, so anything, I guess, is still possible. At this point, <coughs> well, it's not in either bill. It's not in either bill. But then again, Mr. Jones will tell you sometimes you can write legislation and the bills in a conference if you go beyond the point of time. Well, are you still convinced that $200 billion deficits matter, that maybe next year you're willing to consider that? Or uh, year? I would love for us to get this deficit package on the legislative agenda and pass it so that next year we can become what's known as tax technicians as opposed to revenue raisers. For a longer period of time than I want to remember, I have been told that we need so much revenue. And they come to my committee and then we start sitting there juggling around whether it affects somebody or doesn't affect it. How do we get revenue? Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, as I pointed out, I've been there quite a while. And nobody frightens me out there. Uh, if, if they don't want me, I'll come out here and sit with Jim Jones and make myself over 150,000 bucks a year. And so, and so, and so what, 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 I, what I really believe is that, is that we've got to discipline ourselves and we've got to do something that I think will, will reinvest the trust of the American people in their government. And the media doesn't help us either. You know, they don't know that they're citizens of this country. They, they, don't, they don't know that when education is poorly distributed and administered, it's their children too. They don't know when the kids are going wrong and using drugs, it's their children too. They want to stand objectively away at a distance and say, oh, look at how bad those guys are. Well, that's sad, but that's the truth. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Dan, thank you very much. You may have a few media people who want to talk to you right outside. Okay, we'll move across the hall for the afternoon program. Thank you.